This is the Six Man Show, an Orlando Magic podcast, with your hosts, Luke Sylvia and Jonathan Osborne, covering all things Magic basketball. Five fans, four fans. Go Magic! What's going on, Orlando Magic fans? You guys are back with the Six Man Show. Today is July 10th. 2023 Jonathan Osborne here as always joined by my co-host Luke Sylvia Luke what's going on brother how are you I'm doing well Jonathan you know why I'm doing well because I have in one of my computer tabs a magic game box score team stats just like the regular season that's why I'm excited that's why I'm doing well We finally get a little taste of Magic Basketball. It's good to have it back for sure. We'll definitely be uh, recapping Summer League Game 1 for the Orlando Magic from Saturday night, the loss to the Detroit Pistons. Before we get to that, I just want to say a quick thank you to everybody that stopped by the playback watch party that producer Kevin hosted. And I believe Luke joined. I was not able to, to watch it. I was at my wife's. Uh, ten year high school reunion, and she helped uh, like coordinate it and set it up. And you know, she was making the rounds all night, and I didn't want to be like the husband just sitting in the corner on his phone watching basketball. So I watched most of the first half, watched the second half when I got home, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But Kevin did a great job. Luke did a great job. I know Philip Rossman Reich uh, from Locked On Magic and Orlando Magic Daily joined, so really appreciate that. But just. Appreciate everybody that stopped by. If you missed that, then don't fret. Uh, Tonight, as you're listening to this on the 10th, the Magic are going to be taking on the Indiana Pacers at 8.30. So a little bit before that, maybe like 8.15, we're going to be doing another one of those watch parties on playback. So um, I believe the link that we put out uh, Saturday is going to be good for this as well. But we'll be putting that link out. So if you missed that, and you want to join us on playback and kind of see what that is all about. It's a really cool new platform that we're using. I'll be on the lookout if you follow us on Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, wherever. We're going to be posting that link. So very much looking forward to that. And probably going to be most, if not all of us, there on playback being me, you, Kevin. Worst case, we're in and out. But uh, yeah, it, you know, Kevin did a great job holding it down for that first inaugural playback session and then now that probably all of us are able to join we'll be we'll be all in there yep gonna be a a fun time looking forward to game two Uh, before we talk about game one uh, we talked about this a little bit on the last episode but the mat not the magic the nba on saturday have officially announced all of the details surrounding the NBA in-season tournament. Luke, I wasn't able to watch like the launch show, the launch event. What was your opinion on that? How did you feel about that? It was cool. I, I So you had, I believe it was Malika Andrews and Richard Jefferson that were emceeing the event. A lot of people out there in Vegas, obviously. They, you know, put people that went to Summer League, kind of went over to on to that. I'm sure there was maybe some magic fans that migrated over there because Paolo Bancaro was representing the magic. And Adam Silver said some words about it. They did an intro video with Richard Jefferson kind of hosting, narrating the video and explaining breakdown. It was a pretty cool video and it broke things down. I'm very visual, so I appreciated it. And then they brought the representatives out. So the players, I you know, they had Anthony Edwards, Trey Young, uh, Paolo, and other guys as well. But, um, you know, guys kind of from everywhere in the NBA. So it was cool. They did kind of after that, they did the Western Conference groups. They announced those. For those of you that don't aren't aware of like the format, Jonathan has a lot of details about it. But Western Conference representatives were out there. They announced the groups. They had Wimby out there as well with Anthony Edwards. There was one more Western Conference player, and I can't remember who it was. And then they went to break, did the Eastern Conference, had you know guys like Paolo and Trey come out and do their reveal. They all read off the cards for the three different groups. They had some performances. I don't know the names of these these like dancing groups and like 
Cirque du Soleil. Like, they, they, I don't know. The thing was, was they had like the, the cards. The Jabberwockies. Yes, it was. They were they, the, the Jabberwockies were there. Yes, I used to love America's Best Dance Crew on MTV. I used yeah. to watch that every freaking week. They were there, and Richard Jefferson got in on the action and was dancing with them. It was it was pretty funny, and Richard Jefferson, I'm sure, would never do it again. But it was a, a funny part of it. But I also was like, eh, that wasn't really necessary. But the whole thing was they had the representative card or like the group's card, and then they would hand it off to to Richard and the players and stuff. So it was cool. It, I don't know that it was completely necessary, but it just added to the festivities of Vegas Summer League. If it wasn't for Summer League, they would not have done that event. Right. All right. Well, let's talk more about the way that the NBA in-season tournament is going to work. So uh, basically, in each conference, there are three different groups. Um, They are, what is it, five teams in each group. So if you're familiar um, with, like, you know, the FIBA World Cup or Eurobasket or the FIFA World Cup, where you start in group stages and you play teams within your group, and then uh, the best teams from that group move on to the knockout round, uh, it's really the exact same format. So in the group play round, beginning November 3rd um, and continuing through Tuesday, November 28th, each team will play four designated group play games on tournament nights, which are going to be Tuesday and Friday nights, I believe. They're going to play one game against each opponent in its group with two games at home and two on the road. So then with the knockout rounds, the eight teams that advance to the knockout rounds will be the teams that had the best standing in group play in each of the six groups and then two wild cards. There will be one wild card from each conference, basically out of the teams that did not finish best in their group, it'll be each one team from each conference that had the best record in group play will be um, those other uh, knockout round teams. So there'll be eight teams. They'll play through the quarterfinals and then the semifinals and the championship will be December 4th and December 5th. And those games will be played in Las Vegas. So I believe they're playing the, the winner of the entire championship. I believe I heard Luke makes like, five hundred thousand dollars so um all of this is really just going to hinge on how seriously the players take it and it it seems like guys are excited about this luke the magic ended up in a group east c and they have the celtics the nets the raptors and the bulls in theirs and i believe they'll be playing the celtics and the raptors at home playing the bulls and the nets on the road in the group stage. So just what are your thoughts? Is there anything that you thought was interesting about this that I missed? And then what do you think of like the Magic's grouping and their chances just overall in this in-season tournament? One of the the things, obviously you mentioned that each player from the winning team will win half a million for you know winning the tournament. But along the way, uh, the details haven't been really put out there yet because the most important is the, the grand prize. But there are gradual incentives, money that player teams will win depending on how far they get in the knockout stages from what the NBA website says. That's what it led me to believe. So that's one kind of note about the incentives and what might make players care even more and whatever to get at least to the knockout round. Now, as far as the groups, they're going through this on TV and so they do, you know, the West ABC, then they do East ABC groups a and B to me. You know, I didn't have the teams all in front of me, but as they were going through groups, a and B, I was like, those both seem pretty tough. That can't, that has to mean that the magic's group is relatively easy. Comparatively speaking, group a is the Sixers, the Cavs, the Hawks, the Pacers and the Pistons. So Pacers got better. Hawks, Cavs, Sixers, they all have studs on their team. And then the Pistons, obviously, are just a young, promising team, right? Group B is the Bucks, the Knicks, the Heat, the Wizards, and the Hornets. The Bucks, Knicks, and Heat alone make that a difficult group. And then you look at the Magic's group, and it's like, they made out the easiest, in my opinion. And I think that in most people's opinion... They, the Celtics seem to be the only team there that really puts any type of fear 
into me that the Magic go up against. But at the same time, the Magic fared very well against Boston. And in high stakes situations like the group stages, I just feel like this group of young guys is going to care more than Boston. I really think the Magic have a great chance. If the Magic were in like Group B with the Bucks, Knicks, and Heat, or even Group A with the Sixers, Cavs, and Hawks, I'd be like, ah, I don't know if I feel great about our chances. But being the group that we're in, I feel pretty good about it. And then if I don't feel good about like them winning, I feel good about them having one of the best records in group stages. You know, the the team that represents the East that goes to the wild card. Just because of the the teams around them in that group, you're probably going to win some games. I also think like if so the way that all of these drawings happened were uh based off of their regular season record last year like teams were put into different pots and then you know for each group you know a, a team was pulled out of of each pot and for the quote unquote like bad teams the magic are like easily the best of the bad teams like if you look at the east and who you're kind of considering bad teams it would probably be like Detroit you know, Washington, Charlotte, the Magic. The Magic right now are, in my opinion, clearly better than the Wizards, the Hornets, and the Pistons. So not only mm-hmm. did we get a pretty favorable drawing in terms of our group, like the Magic are just, you know, the best uh, team out of that sort of tier. So, And I also, uh, real quick, just want to add, like, Brooklyn, they were in that pot of that group of teams in that pack with their records, right? But yeah. Brooklyn finishes sixth when they're not a six seed team last year with that roster construction. They absolutely are not that. They're more of like a low play in team, even out of the playoffs type of team. So the Magic really benefited that the Brooklyn was the team that got drawn from that pot of teams, in my opinion. Yeah, they got lucky or not lucky, but fortunate kind of both ways there. Like, you know, to your point, Brooklyn is not Mm -hmm. the team that their record says they were last year, obviously trading Kyrie and and moving on from Kevin Durant as well. One thing that I failed to mention is that if you're a team that does not make the knockout rounds, um, Wednesday, December 6th and Friday, December 8th, the 22 teams that do not qualify for the knockout rounds are each going to be playing two regular season games. So, I think the the goal is for basically every team except the teams that play in the championship of the in season tournament are all going to have eighty two regular season games, and I think it's the semifinal and the championship rounds. Who like the stats are not going to maybe it's the, the semifinals and the championship or one of those games or maybe both of those games. I don't remember what it is right now, but are not going to count towards like regular season record are not going to count towards regular season stats. So they're trying to keep this as close to 82 games for everyone, you know, as possible. And then when it comes to those 22 games, they're going to try to make sure that if you don't make the knockout round and you're playing in these, you know, groups of 22 games that we're talking about in the uh, days that, you know, the other tournament games aren't going on, they're going to be like scheduling these on the fly and they're going to try to make it so that you're not playing teams that you're already playing four times that year. So teams outside of your division, but still in your conference. So if you know the Hawks or the Heat or the Wizards or the Hornets are not you know in those semifinal or quarterfinal, whatever you know the knockout stage, um, it's going to be interesting to see how it all kind of shakes out and who the Magic play for those two games. And also, I know that people want to try to be quick to correct, so I will go ahead and throw this in there. The only round that does not count toward regular season stats is the championship. Okay. So semifinals will count. Championship uh, will not count. I, what are your feelings about this as a whole? Obviously, logistically, there is a lot to be figured out, but not necessarily for us. I'm sure the NBA has already figured it out. And they know the formula of, you know, this team's whatever, right? They've probably got all these type of possibilities. All that aside, logistics aside, what are your feelings on the play on this uh, end season tournament? Does do you think it it will boost engagement? I think it'll boost engagement, at least this year in particular, just because people are going to be interested because it's a new thing. How long this lasts and if the league continues to do it is really going to depend on how seriously players take it because if if guys are like sitting out you know during 
group play games because you know for, for whatever reason it doesn't really make a lot of sense that they wouldn't because like you're going to play these games anyways for the most part like unless you're playing the 83rd game in the championship you're going to be playing 82 games anyways and more likely than not you're going to be trying to win those games and if there's a extra five hundred thousand dollars on the line especially for some of these guys on like minimum contracts and stuff like that's going to be huge for them so that's just the only thing that i'm i'm kind of waiting to see is like how seriously the players take it because if this becomes like a super competitive thing and people are really going for it then it's going to be amazing if it's if they take it as seriously as they normally would regular season games or you know guys are being rested and stuff like that then you know i don't think the league is going to let that happen i i feel like if you're resting guys they don't want you really doing that right now anyway but they're going to take extra measures, I think, to make sure that guys aren't resting during these group play and tournament games. So I'm excited. I like group play. Like when you watch Eurobasket or you watch you know, the, the FIBA World Cup, it's like it makes all of these games like really matter. And then when you get into the single elimination games, like we had a blast watching Eurobasket last summer, watching Franz and Germany. And we're going to have a blast this year watching you know, the FIBA World Cup, watching Paolo and watching Franz and all these other guys on the team that are, you know, going to be playing for, for their respective nations. So I'm excited about it. A lot of people are like, oh, this is stupid. Like, maybe it is, but I'm going to be excited about it until I find out that it's dumb, I guess. The bottom line about this end season tournament is that it's not for us. It's not for the NBA fanatics and the guy, the people that have their respective teams that they watch all or majority of their basketball games. This is for the people who say the NBA regular season is the most pointless thing in sports because you play 82 games and it just doesn't feel like there's a whole lot of importance to the regular season. They think once you get to the playoffs, then the best teams will rise to the top in a seven game series. So I get that point of view. I don't agree. But I understand people who say that because you and I, as people that watch 82 games of the Orlando Magic, we know it is a daunting task and we understand that that it does get a little monotonous at times. So I, I think that this is for the casual fan or the person that is not yet a fan for them to get to turn on their TV, you know, on a on a random night in November and December and get to see basketball that matters and maybe players putting forth way more effort than before. This is already something that is a, a success in soccer. They even go a, as far as like, um, you know, with as far as achievements go, the treble is what they call it when you finish with like the best regular season record in their in your league. Um, you win like their mid season tournament, and then you win something else. I don't know. Kevin could speak better to this, but there is something basically they can achieve three things, and if you win all of them, then it is called the treble. And that's something that, you know, soccer fans take great pride in if their team does that because not many people do it. Manchester City did it this past year in their league. So I think that there's a lot of incentive that this does bring. And I'm very interested to see how it plays out amongst really not us as fans, but the casual fan, like I said. Yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, What I think and I I had a a tweet the other day when um one of them i think it's the game against the knicks got pushed from like espn 2 to espn for the magic our summer league game kind of got flexed in a sense i tweeted like what do we think is going to be the over under for nationally televised games for the magic next year because as we know the last two seasons we haven't received any we were supposed to receive one a couple years ago and then that got flexed so it's going to be interesting to see like these games that matter if the magic are on national TV, because I'm guessing that our team is going to take it super seriously because like they're, they're still trying to prove themselves to the rest of the league and they're trying to win everything right now. I don't think they're going to be a team that's worried like, Oh no, we need to rest for the playoffs and you know, for our deep playoff run. So we're going to have these guys sit out like that's not going to happen with our team. So I'm just looking forward that if the magic, do pretty well and I think they're in as good as a position as any you know team in this these you know, group stages 
to have success. And if you you beat the Celtics, I don't we, we don't know when the dates are, you know, for these games, but you're going to be playing the Celtics at home. You beat the Celtics. I mean, you have a, a pretty reasonable path to coming out of Group East C. So uh, it'll be awesome to see if that game is on like ESPN or, or something like that. You know, mm-hmm. these are Tuesdays and Fridays, I think. So maybe maybe yeah. it's on TNT on a Tuesday. Who knows? So yeah, I, and- I'm excited for it. The last thing that I'll add is that the court, so the semifinal and the finals are in Vegas, but the quarterfinals is just going to be hosted at someone's arena, right? Like, so if the Magic are the the better seed in the knockout round, if they perform, I don't know how they're going to do seeding in the knockout round. Maybe they talked about it in the in some articles on NBA.com. But the Magic have a chance to host a quarterfinal game which is like the next six, most exciting thing. And nobody's going to host a semi, the semifinal or the final because it's be in Vegas. So I would love to see a quarterfinal knockout stage game in Orlando. I are the, the city of Orlando and the fan base in Orlando has just longed for meaningful games. And I don't think it really matters what type of meaningful game it is, whether it's a play in game, this end season tournament or the playoffs. I really think that this city would really embrace hosting a quarterfinal game. I hope that we have the ability to do it. Today's episode is brought to you by our awesome, wonderful patrons. If you haven't heard already, we do have a Patreon community where for as little as $2 a month, you can help financially support the show. And we have other benefits like joining our Discord community. We have monthly Zoom calls with our Hall of Fame and Elite Tier patrons. And our Elite Tier patrons can also receive discounts on regular season Orlando Magic uh, home game tickets. So if any of that interests you or you just want to say, hey, I really like these guys and I want to help them continue to do what they're doing, you can find us at patreon.com slash the six man show. And as every episode, we give a special shout out to our Hall of Fame and elite tier patrons. So I'll start with the Court Cousins, Drew Gooden, Armin, Carson Tullo, Jonathan Borges, Normal, Magic Player History, Gabe Gaines, Captain Wiffle, Michael Martin, Jamel Miller, Michael Salapong, The Distract, Donkey Punch Dave, Paolo and Franz is warm, beer, A, nostalgia, and M&M's. Dylan Holden, Mr. Mikey, Eduardo Sanchez, Drum, Danimal, Dodo 15, Bobby Skinner, Goaty 93, Teddy Sylvia, Eric Lopez, Fuchsia, Juan Geraldo, Bill Fulton, Edmund, Lagone, Jose Esquilin, Destin for Greatness, Caleb Pete, Cannibalism, Ty, Mr. TV, ESPN Really Sucks, Gear 95, Shred, Junior, Baruz, Half Reek, and Shahin 177, Bulby the Dawn, Himlo, Ban Himro, R Improv 221, Ray Pastrana, Magic Kids 714, Spank Too Hard, Soft Taco, Jesse, Fuego Nando, Victor Cologne, Phantom Wolf 72, Irish Magic Mike, Austin Lampy, Random Hustle, Only Franz, Maria, Keith Wallace, Fritz, Currency Kev, and Bruv Sal. A big thank you to all of our patrons. Again, you can find us at patreon.com slash the six man show. Luke, let's talk Summer League game one for the Orlando Magic. The Summer League and NBA debuts for rookies, Anthony Black and Jet Howard. The first thing that I wanted to talk to you about, Luke, was this starting five of Anthony Black, Kevon Harris, Jet Howard, Caleb Houston, and DJ Wilson getting the nod to start at center, I guess, for the Orlando Magic. We're talking about positionless basketball. He's listed as 6'10". I don't know how deeply I, I believe that 6'10", but what did you think of the uh, the starting five? Did you find that interesting at all? The one thing I will say about DJ Wilson and him being at center is that he's, while he may not be 6'10", he was still taller than I thought. I don't know why I thought DJ Wilson was like 6'8", 6'7". He's definitely not that. I think he's got to be at least six nine. There was points where, like, I when I first was seeing him on the court, I was like, "Whoa, he looks a little larger than I than I thought he was going to be." What I, in looking at this, it didn't shock me too much. I guess DJ Wilson obviously starting at the center is the biggest thing. You got other options there on the bench, Jonathan, that could start guys that are center height worthy. I would say. Kai Soto being one of them didn't get the start. Uh didn't didn't get any any playtime. But that's the, the the one shocking thing. Really, the the elephant in the room here is that Kai 
did not start over six nine six ten DJ Wilson at center. Yeah, I, I mean, thinking about it, you know, we talked about the fact that Kai Soto and, and Robert Baker the second were the only guys on this Magic Summer League roster listed as centers. So it's like, oh, who's going to start there? DJ Wilson, who's you know four years in the NBA now, him not starting for a summer league team would probably be a pretty bad look for him. So I, I feel like you almost kind of had to start him there. However, as a lot of people alluded to, you know, you didn't start Robert Baker the second, or you didn't start or mm-hmm. even play Kai Soto. James Wiseman and Jalen Duran very much had their way, you know, for, for most of this game. Um, Jalen Duran finished with 17 points, eight rebounds. James Wiseman finished with 16 points, 12 rebounds, which, which really wasn't an issue, you know, for the Magic the entire game. Those guys and their ability to rebound. So it was a little strange, Luke, but I wanted to talk a little bit about like the beginning of this game. It became pretty apparent early on, like Anthony Black's command of the offense, just being an organizer and pushing the pace, putting guys in in good spots. And then a few guys started the game shooting the ball pretty well. Caleb Houston with, you know, some, some early threes, Jet Howard with two early threes, one off the bounce. That was really nice. That got me very much excited. First quarter was was pretty exciting. I believe the Magic trailed at the end of one, but uh, they were up. They were up three. I I knew it was either they were trailed by three or were up three at the end of one. But what were your thoughts like the first few minutes seeing Anthony Black, Jet Howard on the floor together? I thought Anthony Black was going to have sixteen assists at minimum. In this game, he has four assists right out of the gate. Two quick ones to Caleb, one to Jet Howard at least. So he started out really hot, you know, passing the ball around, which I love to see. We we know that that is, you know, one of his strong suits is just his ability to pass the ball and get people involved. So I was happy to see that that's what he leaned on very early on. I was disappointed that he ends the game with five assists and what, seven turnovers. That was the only disappointment to me is that he wasn't able to get a little bit more going on the playmaking side. But as far and we'll get into the rest of the game later where, yes, he he showed more flashes. Don't don't yell at me in the comment section for saying that I was disappointed by that because I know he made up for it in other areas. Jed Howard can can shoot that thing. He he had the sidestep the sidestep dribble three. No hesitation. And splashed it. I was like, this is all I've been wanting. This is all I've been wanting. A guy that's gonna make an open catch and shoot, like he, you know, A B got to him to the to the left wing, I believe. Jet Howard knocks it down, catch and shoot, puts the ball on the floor, able to sidestep dribble, hit the three pointer. I they both showed me so much in that first quarter. It wasn't like I was I was pretty blown away by Anthony Black and his vision and ability to dictate tempo and and run the offense. Jed Howard didn't amaze me, but he still showed me enough to where I was like, okay, I don't want to overreact, but these guys are the famous quote in summer league, right? I don't want to overreact, but, and here's my statement. My statement is, but they looked really great and right out the gate. Yeah. Anthony in the first quarter, uh, it was just uh, two points in that first, but had uh, four assists and a steal. Jet had six points, three steals in the first quarter. As the game went on, and as I as I got home later last night and sat down to watch the game, the things that jumped out at me again were like the pace that Anthony was getting the ball up, uh, initiating the offense, and just the way that he was organizing that first unit. But Jet's playmaking was a nice surprise. He had a couple assists in the second quarter that I was like, oh, wow. And he probably should have had at least one or, or two more, I believe, that guys just like bobbled or, or didn't capitalize on the opportunity. But also like just his uh, ability to compete defensively. He had a play on Asar Thompson in the third quarter where uh, Asar kind of came like through the lane, like from the right elbow over to like the left block and had like this nice like hook shot over Jet. But Jet was with him like every step of the way, and it was a really nice contest. So, uh, again, like we talked about the issue 
on on draft night that Jet just really didn't look great defensively at Michigan and Jet uh, Jeff not Jeff and Jeff and Jet I'm trying to keep those a, a separate here but Jeff Weltman said that night that because of the injury they thought he had potential to be like a real two way guy I don't know that I'm ready to say that just yet again we don't want to overreact to summer league but Jet looked much better defensively than he did most of his time at Michigan and showing off a little bit of the the playmaking chops like that was a, a nice surprise but yeah when he hit that sidestep three like have the magic ever because again the sidestep three is still like relatively new to the NBA you know you're talking about like the last you know five plus years or so the magic have never really had a guy that could knock down that shot consistently so Jet Howard is able to do that that just brings a whole new element to this team. Yeah, and the other thing I want to add about AB is that piggybacking on just his vision and what we've been talking about, his head is always up and ready to get the ball and advance the ball down the court. There was a, I think the the Pistons missed a three at one point. AB gets the ball and just a pretty much outlet pass to the wing at the three. And it might've been Caleb Houston that knocks it down. I cannot remember. It was. it was. So just that play alone really impressed me for a rookie to have just his head up immediately, right when he gets the ball, not to worry about the defender that might be nearest to him and feel like he has to put a dribble move on his defender to then get the ball up the court. He just advances the ball, right? Passing the ball way quicker than dribbling. I used to hear that in middle school all the time. And AB put that to perfection where just get the ball and go. Whether that looks like making the right move or making the right pass, just felt like Anthony Black was super quick to do that. There was one thing about AB's game where I said it in the chat last night. He had seven turnovers. And Kevin points out in the fourth quarter when they're trying to mount the comeback, Anthony Black kind of making some forced passes to get the comeback going. And and so I think to that point, that's why I don't care too much about the turnovers that he had that they, and I can't ignore that they were there. They were there, but he just showed so much all around. That was super impressive. Jet Howard, the box score doesn't really show the flashes that he showed because he did a lot of his flashes early on. I think they were both really great defensively. As you said, too, I, there's a lot to say about both of them. Yeah. In the first half, Anthony black finishes with five points, five rebounds, four assists, a steal. I like just filling it, filling up the stat sheet. And I, maybe I should have assumed this for a guy his size, but his ability to rebound the basketball and get the break going. If Anthony Black and Cole Anthony end up being like the backcourt in the second unit, that's going to be one of the best backcourt rebounding tandems in the entire league. E- either of those guys able to grab the ball off the rim and head the other way and get the offense going. Like I'm, I'm really excited for that. We did see Anthony Black knock down a three. I mean, do we want to jump to the fourth quarter and just talk yeah. about the Anthony Black show? It was fantastic in the fourth. What was yeah. it? 12 points. I think he was like five for five. That included a and one three. Um, it didn't really, he didn't have a, an assist or a rebound in the fourth because he was just busy trying to mount the comeback and get the magic back into that game. But that run that he had where he had like seven straight points for the magic was really fun. People are comparing him to Markel. Some people are like, oh, this guy needs to start over Markel. Everybody relax with that. That's that's foolishness. <laughs> as good as Anthony Black. Like let's 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 get through preseason at least before we start jumping to those kind of conclusions. But I saw a lot of Markel Fulton, Anthony Black, where Anthony Black was like, look, I'm getting to my spot right now and there's nothing that you can do about it. And his ability to do that off the dribble was super impressive in the fourth. And not just his ability to do it off the dribble, his ability to finish at the rim, very impressive and on full display in that game. I, I understand like people are overreacting for sure with the, 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 the AB fault stuff. Do you guys know what freaking Markel Fultz would do in a summer league game? There's a reason he doesn't play, <laughs> but I will say there was a lot of similarities and it does make me think how does this how did they coexist eventually i don't know i will say anthony black hits that three that it's just like the the quarter was a ton of fun and then he goes and does that and it's like yeah of course it goes in off he's the doing glass. whatever he wants 
Yeah, off the glass, exactly. And you could see him laughing about it afterwards, as most players do when they bank a three, much less get fouled on that three. But Anthony Black, he only shot two threes, pretty on par with college in that respect. Hits that one, and it just showed so much. And that's another thing. You and I talked about this, uh, was it a couple summers ago, when Jalen Suggs had a small takeover in a summer league game, I believe. And you and I went on, maybe it was pick a side in the podcast, uh, our buddies over there, and said, do you know how long it's been since we've had a guy that could just go get a bucket? Because Jalen Suggs was doing that in the summer league game. And to be fair, I do have confidence Jalen Suggs can do that now, um, more so than I had the confidence after his rookie season. Paolo Bancaro can do that now, can, get, can go get a bucket. Franz Wagner can go get a bucket. Markel Fultz can go get a bucket. And now Anthony Black can go get a bucket. Oh, Anthony can go get a bucket. Jed That's Howard's right. going to be able to go get a bucket. Kevon Harris. Kevon Harris last got night was able to go get a bucket. Is Kevon Harris too good for summer league? He's in a very weird limbo where it's like he can be the star of a summer. He could win summer league MVP. I'm not even going to lie. He could, he could, he has the realistic chance to win it just in general. Take away last night. If you're just looking at it from a broad point of view, Kevon Harris has the, the skill to dominate G League guys and guys trying to prove themselves because Kevon Harris is already established as a player and he knows how to use his body. He knows how to, you know, bang down low, knows how to get rebounds, is just a guard. He is very talented in that regard. He dominates summer league. He does that as well in the G League. He's in a weird limbo spot, and I do feel bad for him at times, but I know he was having fun last night. He's making whatever it is count that he gets to show. He showed all of it last night. He's also kind of one of these guys that I feel like is in like a G League NBA limbo where like he might be too good for the G right, League. That's, yeah. He plays mm-hmm. really well when he plays in the G League, but it's also like, like who are you going to move off of your roster to make a spot for Kevon Harris? Off any roster, to be it, fair. Right, yeah. So it, he's kind limbo, of in a, in, a, in a weird spot. But yeah, Kevon was great. I, I know he had like the, the cab injury late in the game and, and, and came back in and um and and you know finished uh you know his free throws i believe he got fouled on on that attempt i I just don't know like part of me is like all right i i don't necessarily want kevon taking 13 attempts i'd rather see you know what anthony black and, and jet howard can do with a little bit more offensive load now jet was three of 13 Anthony was seven of ten from the floor. Like I want to see those guys like get fifteen to twenty shots. If I'm just being honest, they're probably not going to play. I, I would guess that much more in summer league. Maybe another game or two. I'd be surprised if it was much more than that. And I'm not. This is not meant to be like a knock on Kevon Harris. Like we know what Kevon Harris brings our roster. That's kind of what I'm saying. Not that I don't want to see Kevon Harris play. And if Kevon Harris is getting the bulk of the shot attempts, the Magic are going to have a chance to win the Summer League games because we just talked about the fact that he's really good. But I kind of just want to see what Anthony Black and Jet Howard and, and maybe even Caleb Houston and, and obviously a lot of these guys that did not play in this game, you know, um, Campbell, Dexter Dennis, uh, Drake Jeffries, Kai Soto, a lot of these guys that didn't play in this game who will play, by the way, as Summer League goes on. That's just how it goes. But would like to see a little bit more from uh, from from the rookies before they they kind of hang it up. Luke, what did you think of Caleb Houston, who finishes the game with what was it, twelve points, four of twelve from the floor, but was four of ten from behind the arc? What did you think of Caleb? Caleb did exactly what I think we know that he is capable of, and that is just shoot the ball like that. That's that's really at this point what would be expected of Caleb Houston on the Magic NBA roster. So I wouldn't say that I was shocked by Caleb's performance. We we know he can shoot the three. It's just that he can only shoot the three. And that's probably going to be his downfall and what causes him not to get minutes. A lot of the way that I tend to evaluate a player's performance, and I've probably said this before on the show, 
if they have a good scoring night, but they're all threes, I don't really care. Like, I, it's yes, it's great. He was on fire, right? He was having an out of body experience. But other than that, what did he bring to the table? I appreciated Caleb Houston's ability to knock down threes last night, shooting 40% from the field on 10 attempts. You'd take that as a season average all year. But the reality is, that's not a, a real opportunity. I don't know. There, there's not. I know that you you're a big Caleb Houston guy. I just I I don't know that I'm really on board with him. It was it's fun when he's hitting threes, but it, you know it's fun when a lot of people are hitting threes. So I I think you're going to be a little bit surprised by this. I was a little bit disappointed in Caleb Houston. Now, am I glad that we're seeing him you know shoot forty percent from three on a lot of attempts in a game? Like yeah, that's awesome. Am I going to believe that Caleb Houston is a you know up upwards thirty percent to forty percent three point shooter just yet? No, need to see a much bigger sample size. But the fact that we now this is kind of a twofold thing because we didn't really see him show that his game has expanded, but I also don't think he was necessarily given the opportunity. Again, twelve attempts, ten of those being threes. Yo, Jet Howard got a lot of opportunity. Obviously, Kevon Anthony Black got a lot of opportunity. I would like to see Caleb Houston probably play most of Summer League and see if he can kind of show us that he's grown as a player, like at all, in the, the right spot the majority of the time. Defensively, he's fine. If he's going to be successful at the NBA level, he's going to need to knock down threes but my thing was like all right you 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 showed us that you've improved the three point shooting kind of want to see more and i'm not saying he doesn't have more just yet it's too early to say that but that's what i'm going to be looking for monday and that's what i'm going to be looking for what is it wednesday and thursday when they play as well so i'm i'm a massive Caleb Houston fan in the sense that i just really like the kid and i do like his game if he can be really good at the things that he does well now, then I do think he is like a rotation guy in the NBA, but he has to be like great at those things, not just pretty good or not like good at those things. If he's going to stick, especially with this team where we've already talked about, there may not be a clear path to minutes for him. And the last thing I'll add about Caleb Houston, and I've got one more point to make here really about this summer league game. Caleb Houston. I don't think he is. And to be fair, like the end of the year, he, his final average from three was almost 34%, which isn't awful by any means. For almost a three shooter, attempts a game when he. A guy that you're saying is a shooter, that's not shooter numbers. And that's what I'm getting at. I don't believe that that is a true shooting number. Now, there is a, a real thing where when you can only do one thing, guys know how to play you. The, on the scouting report, all it says for Caleb Houston probably is shooter. And what else does he do? Not much else, right? He's a fine defender. So what are you going to do as a defender? You're just probably going to be in his face the entire time, denying ball hard. Like you're in hard deny the entire game against Caleb Houston because as long as he doesn't touch the ball, he's not really going to hurt you off it. And he's not going to bring you enough defensively for them to keep him in the game. And 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 so, but I do think that he is better than a thirty four percent three point shooter, as he showed us last night. He has the capability. He showed us in a couple game in a few games last year. I also want to add Anthony Black. Aside from um, aside from Hall, who played eight minutes, Anthony Black was the only player for the Magic last night on Saturday night that was a positive plus or minus. He was a plus four, where a lot of his team, Jet Howard, minus 15, DJ Wilson, minus eight. DJ Wilson was not good. And I, that is also another reason why I think we're going to see, other than the natural progression of Summer League, where the guys are just going to get in. DJ Wilson's performance last night could have lost him some, some opportunity and, and made uh, the Magic coaching staff there decide it's going to be other players turn to get some shine i would venture to guess just given his his you know time in the nba that he probably gets a little bit longer of a leash but if he's terrible again the next game 
then like probably, yeah, like, hey, man, like, sorry, like this is just not working out. We're going to get some other guys, some looks here. And I, I hate that I'm now becoming the anti Caleb Houston guy. But this is a guy who shot 35% from three in college. So it's not like he was a knockdown shooter, you know, in his one year at Michigan either. Like, I've just, like, fallen in love with the idea of Caleb Houston being a shooter because you see the stroke, AO, and you're like, all right, that That's guy good. looks really good shooting the ball. We, good. we need it to go in, right? So if he becomes a 40% shooter, then, like, oh, hey, this guy's out tonight. All right, I have no problem plugging Caleb into the lineup. Because I know he's going to, you know, be able to knock down shots and, you know, defend at a, a decent level and, and not really make a ton of mistakes. But if he's not in that upper 30% shooting, then, yeah, the question is like, hey, what does he really bring you? So that's what I'm looking for in the, the next couple of summer league games here. Let's talk about just really quickly again, like, what are you looking forward in like maybe the next game or two of summer league that will you know maybe see out of Anthony Black and Jet? I hope to see that he just like gets it going and keeps going. I hope that it's not just like a bookend type game again where Anthony Black is, you know, offensively really defensively. He was pretty great uh, through the entirety, but I look for him to not just be great at facilitating the first quarter and not just great at scoring in the fourth quarter. I'm hoping he just puts it all together and it's something we see throughout the whole game and something that brings this team to flow together better. So that's my big thing for Anthony Black. Uh, Jed Howard, I'm interested to see if the the playmaking is real and if the defending stays at this level that it is, if he can continue to care. Defensively, for a lot of guys, it is effort and just how much you care on that side of the ball. It is not hard to get up for your first game and first action as an NBA, and as an NBA player. It is hard maybe in game three or four of Summer League to really get up for the occasion defensively. Offensively, you're always going to get it. But can you do it defensively? And if Jet Howard is the defender the Magic are telling us that he could be, we're going to continue to not only see him play how he played on Saturday night defensively, but even better as these games go on and he gets more comfortable with rotations and, and what their game scheme is defensively. So those are kind of the two things I'm really looking for from each guy. And then Kevon Harris, can he give us 30? I don't know. Can he give us 30 against Indiana? He might be able to. I'm I'm honestly I might be a little bit surprised if we see Kevon again just cuz like the calf thing that happened and also like we've talked about kind of showed that he's like a little bit too good for summer league. I think the biggest issue with this team like DJ Wilson aside, you know, starting at center was the fact that like at least the guys they played on Saturday they didn't have like a a real like pure point guard to come in and keep the team organized the way that Anthony Black did, but that's what I'm going to be looking for from Anthony Black. Like, hey, can you do that again? Like, you, you you looked great on Saturday. Can you do that again? Let's bring down the turnovers. You know, like I don't want to see another seven turnover game. If he has like four or five turnovers, like whatever, I don't want to see another seven turnover game. But like other guys on the roster, like hey he gets you the ball in a good position, you need to put it in the basket. Like he probably could have had, you know, seven or eight assists in this game instead of the five that he had. I want to see the rebounding continue. I'm sure like the defending will continue. And I want to see like a few more like legitimate three point attempts. The one for two, one of them being a foul off the glass. Like it was awesome. Don't get me wrong, but I I just want to see more of him shooting threes so that, we kind of have a better idea of where he's at right now. And Jet, I want to see more of the same of what we saw Saturday. I want to see the ball go in a little bit more. He he did a good job sure. of like creating space and like getting the looks that he wanted. A couple of them were forced, and you could tell, like, hey, it's the first summer league game, but I don't want to see him go three of thirteen again. I also want to see him get to the foul line. Yeah. He d- he didn't get to the free throw line once. Anthony Black shoots three free throws, goes two of three from the free throw line, one being on that three-pointer. But at least he got there, and I would like to see uh, Jed Howard get at least a pair at the free throw line. Yeah, looking forward to that. So that's going to be, again, tonight. If you guys are listening to this on Monday, it's going to be 8.30 Eastern time against the Indiana Pacers. Do we see Ben Matherin in this game? I, I I'm not so sure that we do. 
Uh, but this is also a team that's got guys like Andrew Nemhard, uh, Isaiah Wong out of Miami, Jarris Walker out of Houston. So it's going to be interesting to see our guys match up against the Indiana team. Don't forget, we're going to be doing the watch party on playback. So if you follow us on social media, whether that be Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, be on the lookout for those links. If you have the link from the other night, I believe that will still be good, but uh, maybe don't quote me on that. Just grab whatever link that we're going to post uh, Monday night and use that again. The game starts at 830. We'll probably get on there about 815. So I think we had 42 people that, that came through the, the watch party on Saturday. So uh, hoping we can match that. Maybe even do uh, a little bit more now that people are a little bit more excited about uh, Anthony Black and, and Jet Howard. So looking forward to that. But Luke, before we sign off here, do you have anything else? No, no, that's it for me. Let's uh, let's watch some more Magic Basketball. Let's do it. All right, folks, that is going to do it for this episode. For Luke Sylvia, this has been Jonathan Osborne. You all have been listening to The Six Man Show, and we will catch you guys next time. See ya. Thanks for listening to The Sixth Man Show. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and Spotify to get new episodes downloaded directly to your phone. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps out the show a lot. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Sixth Man Show. We'll catch you guys next time. Go Magic!